I watched the great. Um, the, I was watching a bit last night and a bit this morning. It's so much funnier than I was anticipating. What was it when you first kind of read the screenplay? What was it that first uh, attracted you to getting involved? Um, I think, well, first off, I loved The Favourite. And it's, although quite different, obviously there are some huge similarities. I like the sort of looseness with the historical accuracy. Um, and it's sort of irreverent and funny and very dark as well. Um, but I think, you know, really it was the Mariel because she's fun and sassy and they get a lot of the best lines. You know, she's, um, I knew that I would have a really good time playing her. So I think that really was the main thing. Yeah. No, it's true. I, I think your characters definitely get some bits that a good a good line share of this or good one liners. So I, I, I was going to say, have you have you given much thought to doing more kind of comedy on on screen and stuff? Because I think obviously in this role, I mean, in some ways, it's very it's a very comedically inclined performance in, in many ways. Yeah. yeah, you know, I I actually always thought that I when I <clears throat> when I was at drama school, I always thought that I would go down a comedic route because I um, have always been that way inclined. <laughs> Um, and it sort of was, I was quite surprised, you know, when I sort of took stock of my career and I was like, well, I've done a lot of tragedy because that's not, um, that's not really where I saw myself. So, um, it's kind of, it's really lovely to be able to show that I can do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that quite an interesting thing for, for actors to kind of contend with, I guess, is that sometimes there is a real sense of going with the flow, isn't there? You kind of, you'll, you'll find yourself doing a certain type of role and it might lead on to other type of roles. And next thing you know, 10 years go by and you kind of work, sort of, a lot of actors will work primarily in kind of one genre and stuff. But is that, is, that, is, is that just something that you kind of just have to get used to after drama school, that the ideas of where your career might go sometimes are shifted in, in other directions to, you, to, to what you anticipated? Yeah, I feel like um, there is this perceived notion that we choose the work that we want to do. And um, some actors do, and they're incredibly lucky. Most of us literally take the work that we get offered. So that is that is my career. Those are the jobs I got. Um, I very, very rarely have ever gotten to choose between two jobs, you know. It just so happened with something like The Great. It was like, oh yeah, I actually wanted that one. That's great. Um, so the industry kind of makes it up for you and yeah like in no way could I have predicted the career I had it's definitely not what I imagined for myself at all um, but it is there is also something wonderful of like yes I'm just gonna go with the flow and you know I never thought I'd play Olivia in Twelfth Night but here I am and um, yeah that's why I try not to hold on too much when people ask you know what are your dream roles you know I, well What's the point in having a dream role? It's very unlikely to come around. Yeah. Was that was that quite a, diff a difficult balance for to, to get right when you first get started? I guess there's such an important aspect of of a, of a beginning of a career is exposure, isn't it? It's getting yourself out there, showing off your kind of talents and and credentials, but also mm -hmm. wanting to make sure you do roles that really push you and that you enjoy. Because I guess at the beginning, it is that balance, isn't it? Of just you want to just say yes to anything that will get you on the telly, but at the same time, you want to be in things that are really good. How, how did you find that kind of that, those early stages and that kind of striking that right balance? Um, I mean, I totally rely on my agent to steer me in those in the right directions. Most of it's about actually not even auditioning for the roles that are really um, not going to further your career in terms of variety or whatever it is but um you know there is still a sense of I literally turned to my husband last night we were watching Rocks which was an amazing film, a film. Yeah. incredible <laughs> film and I turned to my husband I was like I want to be pushed <laughs> if I just you know in many ways like you do end up acting within this box that the industry decides is right for you and you can only move so much within that. And then the rest of the time, yeah, it, it's, I think we, we have way less power over our careers than people give us credit for. And most of the time, yeah, 
you you're just sort of desperate to do something else <laughs> that's how I sort of feel most of the time but as you mentioned I mean the great is such a it's, it's a really fantastic kind of tv series how, do, you, do you enjoy kind of doing the whole period drama thing because I guess when you're a kid and you think about being an actor when you grow up a lot of it in that excitement is the kind of world of make-believe isn't it it was like standing behind doors pretending I was James Bond with my sort of fingers mm-hmm. as a gun and stuff well when you're on a period drama and it's so far removed from reality and everyone's in their costumes and the sets are grandiose and and stuff does it does it really tap into that kind of inherent childlike quality that perhaps pushed you into into doing this in the first place it totally does it totally does it has it really like highlights that sense of play because you can't just go to a shop and get an Edwardian gown like you have to go and someone has to hire it for you you know it's it's something that's inaccessible inaccessible to most of us and you know for the great they built these sets this palace is is built and in a way that makes it more exciting because it is like a giant doll's house you know you have all these sort of gilded beautiful doors and if you go the other side they're literally plain and someone's written like Dave was here on the back and there is this yeah it, it's, it's such a heightened sense of make-believe and I do yeah I, I totally chime with that and love it I also get you know, I do do a lot of period drama and I do have those moments of like just wanting to, you know, um and ah and, you know, say swear words. And that's sort of what's great about this piece is that I get the best of both worlds. I get the grandeur of the costumes and set, but I also get incredibly naturalistic dialogue, um, you know, and yeah. Yeah. Do you think we do you think there's almost a disservice to the period sometimes with, with, with some dramas where everyone is talking so proper, but actually people would have been swearing and cursing. And I love the fact that in the great, it didn't feel like we were putting modern slang into an old setting. It felt like actually people probably put it would have been that disgusting back then too. <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. It's weird because a lot of these sort of swear words, um, that probably would have been around are quite bizarre to us now. And um, they, we, I don't think we would understand them as, as you know, someone trying to, you know, make a point. You'd be like, why have they just said quent or whatever? <laughs> you know? um, but it is, I, I think Tony strikes a really good balance because although it is um, modern-ish, the the rest of the language that he uses it, it has a certain formality which puts you in a time and place that isn't you know the 21st century yeah. and you mentioned um you know sort of the outfits and everything like that i'm just wondering when you work on sets like this do you ever try and take a little souvenir home i know some actors always try to to keep one sort of memento or from, from each kind of passing shoot is that is that something you've always tried to do too i haven't mainly because i'm terrify my whole life is dictated by my fear of being told off yeah. so I, I find the idea of stealing something incredibly you know panic inducing but also it's really hard with period drama because most of it's hired um so there's there's a sort of a catalogue and they're like we need to give back the hat the dress the belt you know and if, and if it goes missing all hell will break loose um i've a sort of in a way like instead of taking something away from this job, I definitely left my mark on it because I broke about three doors because it turned out that my character was quite slammy with a door and they're not really built to be, to, you know, undergo that much pressure. And they were just splintering every time I touched them, um, which no one will ever let me forget. So, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, so I was going to ask as well about working with Elle Fanning because I've, 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 I've interviewed her a couple of times and I think the first time was a few years ago when she was so young but she had this kind of maturity beyond her years where she felt like she'd been acting for, for 40 years or something she was so sort of in tune with the way the industry worked and stuff what was it like to work so closely with her on this because I know a lot of your scenes sort of do tend to be with her I mean amazing you're totally right she is incredibly mature beyond her years you I sometimes have to remind myself that she's only 22, whatever she is, 21. Um, And yeah, she's, we were saying the other night how incredibly lucky it was that we've hit it off really well and our mates outside of work, because as with all these things, it's 
it becomes incredibly trying to um, be someone's best friend on camera and then to hate their guts off camera. <laughs> um, but we, I think we have a, a kind of natural chemistry, which you, um, I hope you can see on screen. Um, yeah, she's wonderful, lovely. I have no bad words to say about her. I mean, you've worked with some incredible actors. Um, is there anyone in particular that left a really kind of indelible impression on you that you, you, you were lucky enough to work with, either on stage or on screen? I think um, the person who's left the, the biggest mark on me, I think actually is probably Nicola Walker, who I um, did a view from the bridge with. Um, I shared a dressing with her for two years and she not only inspired me as an actress, but actually just as a human being. And she taught me a lot about being a woman, <laughs> weirdly, is that weird to say? I think that you can get this beautiful relationship between an older woman and a younger woman. And a lot of the time in the acting industry, that doesn't exist. There is this weird, the industry has sort of pitted us against each other. And then sometimes you will get a woman who just sees past all that and she will take a young actress under her wing and be like, I'm gonna fucking tell you what the industry is like and here's how to survive it and all of that. And, you know, don't worry about having kids and don't worry about all the way that you look. And she was that woman for me. She, um, yeah, I feel like I'm sort of growing up under the guidance of Nicola Walker, even to this day. I mean, we've stayed really good friends. Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting you say that because I've had uh, some of my female friends have said that they feel, and this is not even in film, that their industries, respective industries, kind of pit them against each other. It, it, there seems to be quite a widespread thing that's greater than the film industry in some ways. Yeah, yeah, I think there is this um, feeling that's been fostered of uh, there's not enough room for all of us, and um, it's 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 one of the big flaws with the feminist movement, really is that there's so much infighting <laughs> and you know, you know if, if we could all just support each other then um, the world would certainly be a better place for it and I think you're right it's not just sorry I was gonna say everyone wants the same thing ultimately don't <laughs> right totally totally and you know the the acting industry is incredibly difficult place for young women and um, you know some guidance would be amazing and I and uh, it's a shame it doesn't happen more. Yeah. So I was just wondering about, because um, I, I was sort of looking over your sort of career credits today, and it, it obviously I think there's you, you've actually been you've been working for sort of a, a number of years now. Because I was re I was thinking recently in my. Um, uh, work because I I always there's a kind of phase you go through when you're kind of in your early 20s maybe mid 20s where you very much feel like the newcomer on the block and treated as such and always feel like the as a bit of a protege you know someone who is everything's kind of ahead of you and then recently I realized that there's a whole generation of like younger film critics and journalists who and I'm like oh crap I'm not in that bracket yeah. anymore I'm not I'm, I'm no longer a protege I'm now someone that should probably be doing a bit better and I'm just yeah, wondering yeah. now sort of looking at your career if you've had that kind of feeling of realizing that you're no longer the kind of newcomer on the block now and actually you've been you've been doing this quite a, quite a while now with some incredible credits to your name across the years I mean totally it's like it's devastating isn't it when you, realize <laughs> that you're like, you, you, you no longer have any mystery yeah <laughs> um, you yeah. no longer have any yeah. sort of potential yeah no, this um, is it <laughs> yeah, yeah here it is <laughs> I, I i hold quite tightly onto a piece of um advice that my agent gave me which is it normally takes about 10 years so i think i've already hit 10 i hit 10 years i hit 10 years this year actually so i feel like i'm probably still okay um but that that's sort of the timeline for for actors as far as he was concerned if you don't do that thing of coming out of drama school and getting a massive job straight away it's like generally it takes about 10 years and those are the people who you know accept those awards for best newcomer with a wry smile of like yeah, yeah i've been acting for 20 years yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, i was it daniel kalura was up for like newcomer a year ago and i was like, i was literally watching him in things when yeah. i was a teenager um, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but my two of my cousins are, are, are definitely are in the newcomer category because they're only about 19 20 and they, they they've got this kind of conflict in the moment where they or they don't really know 
when they are, if they're an actor or not. Because it's not like, say you want to be a doctor, you, you'll do five years medical school, you'll get a certificate. Mm-hmm. And if someone says, what do you do? You say, I'm a doctor. Whereas with being an actor, you can do so many small parts here and there, but still not feel like, is this my profession yet? And I was just wondering for you, when you had that moment, was there a particular project or a role you were doing where you thought, hang on a minute, this is no longer a pipe dream. I'm no longer a, a drama student. This is, this is my career. I, I am an actor. Um. I think I felt that straight away after leaving drama school. I think because I had had it in my mind that I was going to be an actor since I was a small child. I'd been building up until that point for so long that um, I was very comfortable with that terminology and that career choice. Also because it was what my parents did. So to me, it was always a very viable option. You know, we are actors. It was sort of... um, something that sit sit quite easily I think the the thing that brings that comes to my mind hearing you talk about that is something that I still grapple with as you say 10 years into acting which is the feeling of I know what I'm doing because I still feel like such a, a newcomer in a way and an ingenue and sometimes I forget that I actually have experience and that I um I do know what I'm doing actually I think because I look quite young as well, when um, people are working with me for the first time, they do tend to assume that I am fresh off the block and I'm treated <laughs> as such, um, which doesn't help. No. Um, but yeah, I think that the self-doubt, whether it's about, am I really an actor or am I really good enough or do I know, that, that never goes away, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, it's because what you're saying about this, you realise I've been doing it for 10 years. I realised this year's London Film Festival was my 10th that I've covered in a row. So I'm kind of at that same 10-year phase. And I got asked to do like a lecture uh, in a film school about journalism. And I was like, I I can't teach these people, anyone. Then you realise you you do pick stuff up along the way. You don't (laughs) realise what what experience can actually do. But uh, you mentioned, obviously, it's very much in your family acting. Um, I just wonder, was it something that you decided very young that you, you wanted to do? And do you feel very kind of of at home on movie sets and just or, or, or at the theatres it feel very sort of um close to you in your childhood yeah it does yeah um maybe not so much film sets really um but I feel incredibly uh, at home on the stage um that's a space that I really understand and I think I'm more inclined to actually uh, it, it sort of sounds quite obvious but I think I'm quite theatrical, <laughs> as are my parents. So I, I, I err more towards um, a lot than, um, you know, less is more. It's really not my tenor at all. Um, in fact, I, I get told quite a lot on the grate to just rein it in <laughs> <laughs> because I just want to claw at the furniture, you know. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a real struggle. Um, but, yeah, I, I, like, I got taken backstage the theatre a lot as a kid and um, I still find that quite a magical space to be in um, like we were saying earlier the same thing of, you know going behind the these boards that you know signify a house and you go on the back and it's it's um you know just a piece of wood I don't know um yeah I I still feel slightly uncomfortable actually on set there's still something I think also because of the training I did which is um it's so theatre-based actually or it was at RADA um and we barely did any camera training at all um you know we sort of we weirdly taught how to hold a boom and use a clapperboard and that was about it um so yeah, even 10 years down the line, I still feel slightly uncomfortable. <laughs> Do they feel like very different sensibilities, theatre and, 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 and screen work? Because I've been on, on sets before um, and it's this kind of like sometimes you'll, it, you'll, they'll, you'll spend a whole day doing one sort of three minute scene and it will just be such short because everyone has to get all the different angles and stuff like that. Whereas the stage is, is this kind of long, continuous live performance. When are you... When, when you're on set and when you're on stage, are you almost two different actors? Does it require completely different sensibilities or is it very much a kind of merging of the two? No, I think it's really different, really different. I mean, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I, I spend my time on camera trying to, to minimise myself 
and it and it all has become incredibly internal and it is it's actually for me very very technical and and most of the time what's pumping around my body is a sort of nervous energy of you know oh god i've got to hit that mark and i've got to use that eye to look at them and i've all of that sort of stuff whereas on stage although there is a technicality to it of course i'm way more able to be um free i think and uh um to, to fully inhabit the moment whereas on camera i'm always aware of um what i'm doing and the other people that are there um i don't know if that's unique to me but yeah they they are quite they are quite different i think mm. And did you, um, you sort of obviously mentioned that you've wanted, this has been something you've wanted to do for, for such a long time, but did you ever, did you have a kind of a backup career or any other hobbies that you kind of kept just in the, in the background, just in case? I didn't really, I was sort of, um, I, I am as a, as a person remarkably kind of, I can be quite stubborn. Um, and I saw, I made up my mind that I was going to be an actor as a sort of five-year-old. And um, even when I had, you know, multiple um, things in my way from making that a reality. I mean, it took me three years to get into drama school and I never even considered doing anything else. I was just sort of pig-headedly carried on. Like, no, I, I will be an actor. I will get into drama school. And I did eventually. Um, it's only now that I actually can even comprehend doing something else, weirdly. Um, and that actually, I think what I'm rediscovering about myself is that acting is not quite enough. I really want to create stuff and whether that is writing or directing or actually, you know, creating just artwork, I really need to make stuff being, being an actor is most of the time a very powerless role. And actually I need more power. <laughs> I'm power hungry. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, what are those? Are these quite? Is this are those kind of new ambitions very much in the prelim, preliminary stages, or have you started to yeah, create very much yeah. in the preliminary yeah. stages? Yeah. In the same, I've been kind of thinking about it for the past year. Yeah, but that'll be great. Well, yeah, but I was going to say, but um, you know, sometimes if you want, when people really want those kind of great roles and stuff, just write them yourself. <laughs> Not that it's right. as easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so how's this year been for you? Because obviously you have, you do do so much on stage and I know there must be such a buzz of being part of a, a troupe and part of a collective that comes with being in a stage production or even on a, on a TV series. And obviously this year there's been such a, so much less work out there, particularly in the first half of the year. How have you kind of um, adapted to, to the way it's been um, Yeah, this year? Um... You know, I think when I'll look back on this year, what will really, um, what, what I will think of is that it was a moment of extreme introspection and self-analysis. It's when you take away the, you know, the bright lights of the city and you take away your social life and your work life. Because I didn't start working again until November. So I was not doing anything from February until November. And um, I kind of went, I went inward and had a, I had some real moments of revelation about who I am. And I think actually what I was saying to you earlier, just now about um, realizing that I need to, to create that, that would really, as a crystallized thought, came in the last few months. I knew that there was something that I felt unfulfilled with. And that was, I mean, I, you know, I started a meditation practice and, and all of that. And um, yeah, it's been a time of, yeah, oh. introspection. I can't think of a better word, really. 
Yeah, and I'm the same as you because I think some at the beginning of, of of when it all started, I thought to myself, right, I'm going to try and learn the piano, I'm going to try and learn French, mm-hmm. and actually, I I didn't well, I didn't use this time to be like proactive and do things I've never done. I used it as a chance to try and understand myself better, <laughs> and it's yeah. been quite it's been quite quite good on that front. Actually, so. time well spent. Hmm. When when do you ever get that luxury? Yeah. You know? It's true. Um, so obviously, uh, looking ahead, um, as someone who has got such deep roots in the theatre, are you quite worried about the future of that industry? Because obviously, so many industries have been hit quite hard this year. But theatre is is one that really has. There, there are some. There are you know there are venues and there are productions that are really at risk here. How, how from someone who's sort of very much inside that world, are you are you quite anxious about the the future of theatre in the UK? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, London will be fine, largely, I imagine. Um, It's the regional stuff that's really um, worrying. I mean, a lot of those theatres have gone, haven't they? I think that was some of the first few casualties in in, um, the beginning of lockdown. Was it Portsmouth or there's a couple of theatres who were like, we, that's it. We don't have any money, you know. And... uh, it, my my family have made um, that 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 was <laughs> that was the career that supported them. That's that's how they earned their money and still do is through the theatre. And for a lot of actors, that is their their lifeline. You take that away, you know. It's a, most um, actors who work in the theatre are scrabbling um, to make a living from it anyway. And and when you get this, um, obviously people aren't going to want to go and sit in theatres and the way that they're going to make uh, it appealing is to cast famous people in all the plays um so it is yeah I don't know I I don't honestly I try not to think too much about it (laughs) um it's a bit scary yeah so my my final question uh before I let you go and probably have some lunch is um looking ahead to to next year I mean obviously this year was a a mad year of so many cancelled projects and things that lots of things were just paused and pushed but how's how's 2021 looking for you have you got much kind of in the pipeline or is it or do you think that there's still kind of knock-on effect from the the uncertainty of this year I mean I think that we will um I think there was this idea that we just need to get through 2020 um uh which is it's sort of come as a bit of a shock when they just said the other day that we'll be London will be you know in restrictions until February and everyone was like but February 2021 that's not part of the deal. Yeah, if I could, um, wait, we just need to let this year end. It's like, yeah, because it was only 2020 that was just <laughs> shitty. Um, I'm I'm on the grate until July. Oh, nice. Um, and then who the fuck knows? I don't know. And I'm also trying to sort of let go of of having any real plans because then you can't be disappointed. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. So have you been on set? Is that where you started in November, the great series? Yeah. 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 So I, just, just quickly on that, I'm just as I'm someone who's quite new just to the first series, but tonally, is it is it very much of the same thing for fans who love the first series? Is it, is, can we expect a bit more of the same or is it going in a different direction? Oh, it's, yeah. If, if you loved season one, then um, you're going to love season two. It's more of the same. Lovely. That's all I wanted to hear. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time today, Phoebe. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And um, I hope you have a lovely Christmas and best of luck with the second season. Hopefully we'll catch up again one day. Who knows? Right. Merry well, Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys.